welcome to the Cultivating Health Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Gephardt. The Cultivating Health Podcast is a product of my unquenchable thirst for knowledge and my overwhelming passion to share that knowledge to improve people's lives. Utilizing the seven dimensions of wellness as a foundation, we will participate in conversations with experts in the field, exploring all aspects related to building a totally well individual. And if you're not familiar with those seven dimensions of wellness, they are spiritual, physical, emotional, professional, intellectual, environmental, and social. Before we get to our guests on this podcast, I need to thank a couple supporters for helping to make this podcast possible. Is your startup venture or small business looking to grow? Limitless Investment and Capital is a CPA firm specializing in startup and small business accounting and finance. Their team of CPAs and business consultants can tailor business growth services specifically designed to deliver optimized results for your business. They can do it all, ranging from accounting and bookkeeping services, tax preparation and assistance, contract or part-time CFO and controller assistance, payroll, general counsel services, management consulting, and more. Their clients are not just numbers, they're people that they know and work hard for. As your business grows and evolves, they'll continually adjust their services to keep pace with your needs and help you get to the next level. They are the go-to small business experts and would love to get a conversation started today. You can find them on the web at LimitlessInvestmentAndCapital.com or reach them on their office line at 1-800-314-0653. Again, that's 1-800-314-0653. Full disclosure, my buddy Mike is the owner of that company. He's the founder of that company, and I've known him since we were 10 years old, so well over 20 years. He's a good guy, he's trustworthy, and I'd be confident to give him my business. So I highly recommend him. This podcast is brought to you by Precision Haircuts for Men. Located in Southgate, Michigan, Precision Haircuts for Men provides the highest quality precision haircuts and beard shaves in Southeast Michigan. Located centrally on 4th Street and Southgate, bordering Wyandotte, Precision Haircuts for Men is an easy in and out on your daily route. Set up your appointment today at PrecisionHaircutsForMen.com or click the Book Now button on your favorite social network. Look up Precision Haircuts for Men on Instagram, Facebook, or Google to find us. Laura Putnam is the founder and CEO of Motion Infusion, located in San Francisco, California. Her company is a well-being consulting firm that provides creative solutions in the areas of engagement, behavior change, and human performance improvement. She's a highly sought after speaker in the wellness industry and has written a really great book called Workplace Wellness That Works. I've had the pleasure of reading it and it completely transformed the way I viewed and approached workplace wellness. It was an honor and privilege to chat with Laura, so I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Please help me welcome Laura Putnam. Hi, this is Laura. Hey, Laura, it's Justin Gephardt. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me a little bit. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Awesome. Let me plug it in my headset. Sure. Take your time. Uh, and let's see. And let me know if the sound is good enough um, once I do. Hold All on. Right. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Sounds good. All right. So let me go ahead. No, I'm ready. I, I was just gonna say uh, I was gonna give you a little bit of an update on my situation with Amazon. I feel so bad. I feel like I uh, like I wanna put this review on Amazon, but I think they hate me now because <laughs> <laughs> I've tried four times to put this review, and the last three just they don't respond to it. So I I'm. I'm going to keep trying, Laura, but uh, who knows what's going to happen. So I, I apologize for that because I feel like at the very least, I owe you that much. So Well, um, thank you, and uh, thank you for your persistence. And I don't really understand it either because um, there have been some others who have, like there were some, some that were up and then they deleted them. Yeah. And 
it's really weird. I don't really understand it. Um, so I know in some cases it's if the if they're not a, if there's not a verified purchase, they'll delete it. But in your case, it is a verified yep. purchase, so I don't know why they're being weird about it. But I, I do appreciate your persistence, and um, you know, no worries. I mean, you can also go to um, Goodreads and post a review there. Okay. So if um, you know that's helpful as well. Yeah. But um, you know, obviously Amazon is what people look at the most. And, yep. um, so if you are able to ever do it, that's great. But if, if but I certainly understand if they're just not going to let you do it, they're not going to let you do it. So well, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, I'll, maybe I'll try the other one and see if that, see if that'll work. But I know okay. the most recent time that they responded to me said it was, it had to do with the image. So I didn't know if that meant like what I wrote, it painted an image that had nothing to do with your book. But that made no sense because I only wrote about your book. But then I'm like, maybe it's because I attached an image to it, like my profile image. So I'm like, maybe if I submit the review without my image attached to it, just no image at all, then maybe they'll accept that. But I haven't heard back from that one yet either. So we'll see what happens. Okay. Okay. So, well, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay. So anyway, I noticed from reading your book that you started mm -hmm. off as a teacher. And yeah. What's interesting is my undergrad degree, and I'm actually still currently a certified phys ed and health ed teacher in the state of Michigan. Oh, cool. Yeah, so we have that in common, which is obviously part of the reason why I am a fan of yours, right? One, well, of, the, one of the main reasons. Oh, sure. Um, so I guess that's kind of how I wanted to start off with you is how did you go from, obviously you kind of talk about it in the book, but. How do you? How did you go from teaching into becoming the you know, the wellness, the sought after anyway, author, speaker, employee well being expert that you have, I guess, come to be now? Well, great question, and um, thank you for that yeah. compliment. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I what I really attempted to do when I started Motion Infusion was to pull together different threads of my life. Mm -hmm. So that included teaching, but it also included my background as a competitive gymnast, mm -hmm. which I did all the way through my childhood and as uh, and also was a scholarship member of the Stanford women's gymnastics team. I was a professional dancer. I um, And I had been in the space of kind of physical uh, fitness for a long time, a lot of times on the side, sometimes full time. And then I also had this thread as a teacher and then also had a thread as public policy international work. So motion infusion was my best attempt to pull together all those different threads in a meaningful way for me to kind of figure out my way of um, having impact on the world. Makes sense. Makes sense to me. What What did you teach? If I I can't remember off the top of my head, so forgive me. History. 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 Yeah, and there were two kind of events that really sparked motion infusion. You know, more specifically beyond kind of that general, um, you know, painting of trying to figure out how do I pull these different threads together. But but the two the two. Uh, more specific prompts were one was as a teacher, I um, had been kind of going in and out of my as a dancer, my work as a dancer. And um, so I looked for ways in my history classes, in my high school history classes, to integrate movement into the class. Mm -hmm. And even if it was something as simple as creating rotating stations where students would have to get up and move from one mm -hmm. table to the next, I always look for ways to do basically what I'm trying to do, you know, what the call to action is now is to look for ways to infuse more motion into whatever it is that you do. So even in a high school um, setting, how can you do that? And what I found is that it really helped to deepen the engagement for my students and, mm -hmm. and create a more powerful learning experience. So that was one thing that really prompted motion infusion. It's like, wow, you know, when we move, not only is it good for our body, but it's really good for our brains too. So how do I take that idea and turn it into something that's bigger? 
beyond my classroom. And then the second piece that really prompted me to start Motion Infusion was I had been working with people one-on-one as a Pilates instructor. Mm -hmm. And I found myself saying the same thing over and over again, which was, it's awesome that you're here, but you really need to be moving the rest of the day. And kind of across the board, they would all say, I wish I could in the place that I work, but I just can't. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them even talked about the fact that their company had an on-site gym and nobody went there. (laughs) So I really felt like I needed a broader platform. And so that's, that's kind of where all of my, the interest in becoming a speaker and an author really um, came from was that I just wanted to reach more people. Yeah. I think the fact that you were able to, implement that that movement within your history class there's over my journey anyways my experiences my education that's the one thing that has been happening a lot especially since 08 you know taking physical education away from students taking recess away from elementary students and it's like wait a minute kind of like what you just said right the more we move the more exercise we get it's i mean data shows research shows that that's actually better from a standardized test perspective. Standardized tests, I can do away with those, but that's a whole different conversation. But anyways, just the student performance, student behavior is improved significantly from that exercise, but yet we're taking all of that away from these kids. And it, I'm, I'm with, it just, just doesn't make any sense to me. It didn't make any sense to me. So which is, that's kind of part of the reason why I went down the... Uh, the phys ed route and the health ed route, because one, I loved exercising and I wanted to take that into the the classroom myself. Not to mention my dad was a history teacher for 37 years. Oh, cool. Yeah. So that's an additional commonality that we have. So, well, I, I could not agree with you more. And there is such a profound disconnect between not only the research and what the day-to-day kind of business as usual mm-hmm. is, whether it's in our schools or in our uh, in the workplace, but also there is even a disconnect between what the research shows and um, and what the policies are around it. Oh, yeah. It just doesn't make any sense. And um, you know, as and and you know, what's happening tr- with the trends? I mean, a- as childhood obesity skyrockets and now one in five of our children are not just overweight but obese Mm -hmm. meanwhile we have less pe than we've ever had before (laughs) and it's like how does this make any sense and um and similar when it comes to what these kids are eating at school i I, I mean the last school that i taught at was a charter school Mm -hmm. and the the founder of that charter school there was it was a network of charter schools when he would look for a site he would actually look for places where there was a concentration of fast food restaurants for the school site because there was no we didn't have any you know the the school didn't have that money um charter school didn't have the money for on-site any kind of on-site facilities for food so uh he would look for spots where there were fast food restaurants so with the intention of uh, that the kids would go to these fast food restaurants for their lunch that is so that is so frustrating but you know in in a lot of ways it's it's sad and it's frustrating for us who uh, who are you know probably more you than me but knowledgeable or educated on the topic but i feel like a lot of people just culturally in america it's just okay it's food we got to have food so that's the closest that's the quickest let's make sure we're close to it right they don't I feel like it's so difficult for, and I, I don't want to discredit anybody, but it's so difficult to, what, I guess, expect people to know this, that, that all of these things matter. The movement matters, what, what you're eating matters from a performance standpoint, you know, the environment that you put yourself in, especially in schools, at work, that all matters from a longevity standpoint from a productivity standpoint from a knowledge standpoint a success standpoint and i just think you know all the the advertising that we see all the different fast food restaurants that we pass you know in a two mile stretch when we're driving like 
It's just what we've, as Americans, we've just come to know this is what it is. So it's like, as frustrating as it is for me, I try to, as often as possible, try to uh, remind myself that all these people in America, as I'm sure you know as well, uh, are kind of conditioned that this is just the way that it is, and they're not necessarily aware that it's kind of detrimental to us. Well, I guess that kind of well, gives I, us... I would actually disagree with that. I think, that it, I mean, I, I'm going to agree and disagree. Okay. I, I would agree with the part that I think that we're really conditioned mm -hmm. to um, just accept this as a norm. Mm -hmm. But I think that when it comes to basic awareness, the problem is people already know. You'd be hard-pressed to find... Any smoker who doesn't know the smoking is bad That's for them. You'd be hard-pressed to find anybody who doesn't know that it's a good idea to eat more vegetables yeah. or anybody who doesn't know that it's a good idea to get more exercise. And yet, with those three basic those three basic practices, less than 3% of Americans do those three basic sure. things. Yeah. No, so yeah, it yeah. is not a knowledge issue. It is more of a culture issue, an yeah. environmental issue. Sure. And, um, and I think to a fault, we keep framing up wellness as a matter of, quote, taking personal responsibility sure. for your health and well-being, mm -hmm. when it's really more, just as you're describing, the larger culture yeah is one that makes health and well-being actually really, really difficult mm -hmm. to to actually attain. And and their pockets, like where I live in the Bay Area, I can go out to dinner every night and I can get a, a very healthy yeah. meal. Yep. That is not the case in uh, most parts of America. I would I would agree. I would mm -hmm. agree wholeheartedly. And I think so getting getting into your book a little bit. Yeah. Um this is kind of a, a springboard into this question, so I think it kind of works out, but you just mentioned just their wellness and well-being. And I know in your book that that a lot of your book, to be perfectly honest, it it really changed the way I viewed workplace wellness, employee wellness, workplace well-being, because I had had a job working in employee wellness. And I had that job for a little while but my view of employee wellness when I was in it compared to my view of it now is drastically, drastically different. And I'm thanking you for that. Not to, oh, uh, yeah, not, not to be too, you know, I'm not trying to brown nose or anything, but I'm being dead serious because from a basic standpoint, your continued statements of wellness versus well-being and in a life of uh, vitality. So I was wondering if you'd be willing to talk about those differences between wellness and well-being. What what made you come to the conclusion that it was necessary that we switch from a view of wellness, which is mostly, you know, the physical dimension to well-being, which is more of a holistic approach to lifestyle or environment or workplace culture. So if you would expound on that, I would love to hear it. So the, the first thing is that I personally uh, am not as concerned about, do we say wellness? Do we say health? Mm -hmm. Do we say well-being as I know others are? Mm -hmm. And um, in my view, uh, it's really about how do we help human beings to be human beings yeah. when they're at work, when they're at home, mm -hmm. when they're uh, at school, when they're anywhere in between. And um, so, I, but I do think that more, more and more people associate well-being with addressing multiple dimensions of wellness mm -hmm. or well-being, whereas people tend to associate wellness more with the the basics. Uh, related to physical health yeah so in my view it's like whatever works yeah so, no, sure yep. if it works for this audience to say wellness we'll say wellness if it works for this audience so we say uh be more human let's say that if it works for another audience we say well-being whatever it is mm -hmm. uh, let's let's call it that so uh but just with the understanding that it's much more than just getting better eating a healthier diet yeah. and getting more exercise mm -hmm. while those are important yeah. that there are other domains that really matter a lot things like financial well-being mm -hmm. things like being connected to one another sure. uh, things like giving back and so um, I think that there has been a real 
transformation in the field moving toward that broader understanding of really what it means to thrive, mm -hmm. uh, what it means to live a life well led. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about that is that by expanding what we're talking about, then it suddenly it starts to really create connections with, with other domains like the field of learning and development mm -hmm. or like the field of psychology. Yeah. Um, or like now what we're, you know, seeing with uh, well buildings, um, yeah. you know, w intersections with the field of architecture. Mm -hmm. So um, and even urban planning, you know, all these uh, really go together um, and are just these multiple dimensions of what we need to have in place to enable people to thrive. Couldn't couldn't agree more. Thanks for that. I also you kind of hit on this a little bit, too, um, but we have. Ever since I read your book, again, I've pretty much everything I've done and any work that I've been doing has really kind of had the foundation of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I think that's super interesting, especially when it comes to the, the social aspect of well-being. I think that's one, one thing, we can get into that later, but that's one thing that I really have been focusing on a lot lately is the social aspect um, for my own personal reasons, where I where I live, how I grew up, and the experiences that I've had. But um, okay, so uh, what was I going to ask? So you kind of already talked about how important those things are for creating that that culture of well being, or that culture of wellness, or just the the holistic composition of a totally well individual so <clears throat> can you talk a little bit more about the the agent of change model that you kind of talk about or the the agent of change that we need to be within our workplace or our communities that we live in but then also this is a little bit i'm trying not to jump all over the place but one thing that i really find interesting about especially the workplace culture is those intrinsic motivators that you talk about in the book as well. And one of those things that really interests me of those intrinsic motivators is including play within the workplace. So those two those two questions I was hoping you could, I don't even know if you don't have to link them necessarily, but the two topics I was hoping you could, you could touch on are your ideas or your approaches to the you know, being an agent of change within your community, whether that be at work or anywhere that needs one, and then utilizing that intrinsic motivator of play. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, every time I work with an organization or every time I get ready to deliver a talk or a workshop, I'm always thinking, do I want people to know, do, think, or feel as a result of our mm -hmm. time together. And the most important thing when it comes to well-being is that we we are hoping that people will do something differently mm -hmm. in a positive direction as a result of whatever intervention we create, whatever program we create, whatever piece of information goes out, whatever conversation happens. Um, all uh, that are all tied to this idea of promoting health and well-being. And uh, so I think a lot about what is going to inspire people to actually make change. And, and what I have found is that people find it a lot more motivating to imagine themselves as agents of change. Mm -hmm. and, um, and each of us really is much more powerful than we might imagine. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, how do we tap into that? And and the, you know, people are more motivated and inspired by the idea of being part of a movement as opposed to being part of yet another program or, God forbid, an intervention. So I, I really try to move the conversation away from a biomedical model uh, and all of its corresponding language from uh, you know things like risk mitigation, uh, risk stratification. Um, knowing your numbers, all the, you know, population health management, disease management, all of these clinical terms that uh, may help us to diagnose the problem, but they do very little to actually 
move a population forward. Um, whereas if we think more carefully about language and activities um, and stories uh, that will move people, then we're more likely to, um, people are actually, are more likely to do something differently as a result of those efforts. Sure. Uh, they're more likely to feel something differently. And um, so that really ties to, you know, what is it that intrinsically motivates us mm -hmm. on a really deep level? And it's, it's not things like, am I going to be paid yeah. or, uh, you know, am I uh, avoiding a punishment? But rather it's things like, is this fun? Do I yeah. want to be part of it because it's fun? Yeah. Or is this meaningful? On a, on a much deeper level. Um, and, and so we have to think about how we can redesign our efforts so that people actually want to be part of them as opposed to feeling like they have to be part of them. Yeah. I, I, that's the one thing that I, that I keep coming back to when I think about the cultures in which I've worked in, which my experiences, a lot of my experiences, unfortunately, haven't been all that positive. I try to think about when it comes to changing a culture of a workplace, because you can, as I'm sure you know, you can feel that. Like if you're in a, a, a bad one or a negative one, you can feel that every time you go into it. And obviously there's a, a huge influence of management or executives, the the higher ups that make the decisions, quote unquote, or supervisors for that matter, that really play into and create that culture. And I really think that, as I you know, learned partly from your book, that they're the ones who play that play that big role, who create that culture. So how can we then get them to understand, get them to be on board with changing these these approaches, changing these things. And obviously there's so many different avenues you can pursue and so many different things you can implement to try to, obviously culture change takes a long time, but over the course of that time, there's so many things you can implement and you can change to where that you can't feel that negativity and that fear every time you go into work. So I guess that that's my next question for you is how can you, I know you talk about culture audits in your in your book. How can you approach those decision makers and then I guess assess that culture and then make them or not make them but try to get them to understand and be on board with the things that need to be changed in order for their employees not to feel that fear when they come into work or not to feel stressed or overworked or just, you know, uh, altogether down and negative when they're at work and feel more of that excitement or happiness or fun when they come into work, when they have those connections with people and just the, the, a positive culture as opposed to a negative culture. That was kind of long winded. So I can repeat that if you need to, but feel free to, uh, expound on that. So you're asking a lot of different questions yeah. in Sorry. that. So, you know, I'll, I'll touch on a number of these. Um, the first is, uh, you know, yes, uh, changing a culture is really hard to do. And um, one of your first steps will be to just simply start to assess the culture. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to simplify it and uh, just clear, help uh, understand, you know, to, to what extent is this, a have to culture as in people feel like they have to be there yeah. versus a want to culture. People yeah. actually want to be there. And that's an important thing to understand before launching any kind of an assessment uh, or any kind of a wellness program or initiative is to really take a deep dive into the culture. Then um, in terms of, you know, how do you measure it? Um, certainly there are things like, um, Q12, Gallup's Q12, um, a lot of, you know, well-known assessment tools for measuring culture, for measuring the extent to which people are engaged with their work, um, to measure, uh, you know, what kind of an environment it's like. Is it toxic or is it one that um, where people can really flourish, where they connect with one another? 
And um, then there's the piece that you're asking about, well, how do we engage these leaders since obviously they play a pretty primary role in, in moving these cultures. So the way I look at this is there's the senior leaders who really set the tone and mm -hmm. allocate resources for whether it's wellness um, or um, culture. So a great example of that is Douglas Conant, who was CEO of Campbell's Soup. Mm -hmm. He was brought in to turn around a failing company. Mm -hmm. And what he saw was that the company was failing be because it had a negative culture. Yeah. And so he said about, um, he thought that the way to turn around the company was to, to, to change the culture. And he felt like that the way to change the culture was to start to build a culture of appreciation. So he made it a regular practice to identify employees to thank uh, in the form of a thank you note, a written thank you note. Um, so showing written recognition mm -hmm. and it's, he spent time every day writing these thank you notes and it's estimated that he wrote over 30,000 thank you notes during his eight year tenure. Oh. And, uh, and that simple action, which I'm sure was part of many, many other, um, ways that they changed the culture, but that really helped to turn around the culture. And, and in doing that, the company really turned around. It went from uh, being underperforming to, to really uh, outperforming the S&P fivefold. Um, so great example of what can happen when a senior leader really takes that on. Um, or another case is more recently, the CEO of, of Cisco wrote an email that went out to everybody in the company following the the duo, uh, the dual suicides of Anthony Bourdain and mm -hmm. and Kate Spade, and um, just talking about the importance of mental health and how much he supports everybody in their mental health and how we need to acknowledge this issue. Those kinds of, um, in some ways, symbolic gestures can be really important for setting a tone that mm -hmm. this is kind of this is what we stand for as a company. But the the interesting part is that. Um, what people experience when they come to work in terms of the culture and, and also in terms of what they experience in terms of their engagement with their work and, and also their overall well-being is really primarily determined by their team leader. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really, so culture is to a large extent really experienced team by team by team. And you're, you're always going to see a greater variance between teams within the same company than you will see uh, between companies. Right. And um, so that's where the role of the team leader is so important. And that's really been a lot of our work is, is really around empowering those team leaders. And so while a lot of them feel disempowered, um, there are a lot of things that are, in fact, within their sphere of influence mm -hmm. that, that they have the capacity to be able to carve out a little oasis of well-being, a little oasis, sure. um, pocket of excellence for their team. And, um, and those little pockets can uh, create a cumulative effect to kind of create this middle out movement. And certainly something that I've seen in working with companies like Schindler Elevated Corporation, where it was really a manager-driven movement mm -hmm. uh, that moves throughout the organization. But um, the, the manager is really the, the actual permission giver. Yeah. And that's, an, a, that's a really important piece in the puzzle uh, around how do we move cultures and um, to better uh, support well-being. Isn't that, I believe that's one of the, I've read this, multiple different places but that's one of the main reasons people leave their jobs right is because of their relationship with their direct supervisor or lack their that's own, exactly right so that's gallup research yep. and yep. there's um th their research shows that about 50 percent of people don't leave their job they leave their boss yeah. um there's other studies showing that it's as high as 75 percent believe it there yeah, and there's, but you know, there's even more frightening research. Uh, a Swedish study recently found um, that when it comes to the health of your heart, your boss matters more than your doctor does. So when we hear people say, "My boss is killing me," they yeah. actually kind of mean it. Yeah. So uh, this is something that in my work with managers, I, I have a workshop called Managers on the Move, which has been delivered to over a thousand managers and leaders across the country. Awesome. 
and this is a, a message that uh, that I really um, am sharing with them over and over again is just how vital they are to the livelihood of their team members. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. Again, my my work experience, it's uh, or my at least my my negative ones for that matter. Unfortunately, it's it's been, uh, you know, obviously you're kind of responsible for your own behavior in a lot of in a lot of circumstances. But you know, if I have I, I have had supervisors who haven't made me feel all that valued or like I matter all that much, and it's really tough. And I think the information that you just shared that the Swedish study, the, the Gallup information that you just shared, paired with, I, I want to say I read something recently too, it was also on Gallup, where it was like one one in 10 people or one in 10 managers or something like that, it was one in 10, I think it might be one in 10 people have the necessary talents to be an effective leader. But then also I read that the the two main reasons that people are in managerial roles or supervisor roles is because of their long-standing tenure at the company and and or that they were good at their previous job. And this article was saying neither of those things are qualifiers for being a good leader or a good supervisor that you know so they the reason people are in their supervisor roles aren't necessarily because they're good supervisors it's for other reasons. So I think uh, what you're doing, the work you're doing with those seminars, reaching reaching all those managers, I think that's hugely, hugely important. So I certainly thank you for doing that. And hopefully someday I'll be able to uh, sit in on one of those because I'd love to hear it. And I think the more, more people who do, the better off we're all going to be. Well, that's actually uh, the subject for the next book that I'm working on right now, that I'm currently working on, is on this very topic of empowering the, the team leader. Awesome. To become a multiplier of well-being. So Great. That'll I'm, be out. I'm looking forward to reading that one. I'll def I definitely will. Um, to add to that, you kind of mentioned with the CEO of Campbell's and Cisco, just the you know, the writing the thank you notes, letting people know that they're valued, letting people know that they matter. I think that that goes a long way, whether that's in the workplace or in your personal life, right? Letting people know that, that they matter, that they're valued. Um, it's, again, like you said, it can be a symbolic gesture like that that can go make massive gains in so many ways people wouldn't even be, uh, wouldn't be able to comprehend it, I think, um, just, from, just from doing those symbolic things, but also to move on from that a little bit. I'm curious. It's kind of it's kind of linked, but a little bit a little bit different perspective. And I was hoping I asked Larry Chapman the same question when he was nice enough to chat with me. And I, I'm interested in your view of it as well. And it goes along with feeling valued and cultures and making sure or feeling like your your supervisor or your management has your back. Uh, firing. Um, the one of the jobs that I had years ago, it was a very regular routine basis that there were people that were getting fired. And the reasons for that, I never thought I didn't know all the reasons, but I knew some of them. But I never thought that they were legitimate reasons to fire somebody. And since then, I've learned I forget what what source I got this from. But I read that 75% of firings or attrition or losing employees are preventable, right? And the cost of replacing employees are pretty significant. So I guess I wanted to get your thoughts on just the, the act of firing in general, the process of firing in general in the workplace, and whether you think that because Larry, I thought, had a really unique perspective on it, one that I didn't really even come up with. But I was wondering if uh, you might have some of those same perspectives. Because for me, I've had the negative experiences that I've had. So I think I've, I've kind of limited myself on my views of firing. So I was hoping I could get your opinion on that. Well, it's 
here's the thing. There's a company called Next Jump, and Next Jump, okay. th- their um, CEO believes that when a com- when the company hires somebody, that they are hired for life. I like so it. So nobody gets fired. Yeah. And um, he believes so much in the power of coaching and learning. Um, he believes that everybody can be coached so mm-hmm. that they don't need to be fired. And obviously, they're also doing a very careful job of vetting potential uh, prospects to right. make sure that they've got the right people right. On, uh, coming in. But uh, at that company, employees are encouraged to spend 50 as in five zero percent of their time every day on um, both personal and professional development. And hmm. uh, so it's really through learning that people um, are A, in, engage in their work, but also that's, uh, that through coaching, uh, you can really turn around a negative situation to become a positive one. And that, that all comes from the top, right? I mean, you kind of have to create that from the from the jump so everybody's got to be on board with that right yeah i mean it certainly helps to have uh, the the founder and ceo embracing this that this is part of their core values and that uh, a better me equals a better us equals a better world and um, and that's really something that is not only part of their core values at next jump but it's also part of their uh, day-to-day practices and i think that they're or a lot of companies that have similar kind of language but aren't necessarily practicing it. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think that there's also a lot of companies that still have outdated, uh, punitive kind of approach and and don't actually believe in um, in every person's potential to learn and to make improvement. And um, so, you know, that's a a philosophical difference. And... um, you know, it's uh, do companies and do their leaders believe in in the power of um, of people being able to continually learn and grow? Uh, do they believe in the power of a growth mindset, um, yeah. or are they coming in with more of a fixed mindset that you're either a good employee or you're not? You're somebody who um, is an underperformer and should be fired because of it, or you're an underperformer and you can be coached so that you can do better. Yeah. I- I'm I'm in the latter group, obviously. I think you kind of mentioned the vetting of candidates, and that's one of okay. the things that Larry spoke about. And I thought that was a, a good point. But then also he mentioned the the fact that being fired for some people can be incredibly motivating. And I, I thought that was a, a valid point as well. Although I don't think... I think that should be, that was kind of my point to him was, I think that should be the absolute last option when you hire somebody is firing. And if somebody does get fired, there's procedures in place, there's steps in place, there's obvious benchmarks in place to where if somebody does get let go from a job, everybody involved is well aware of it. So that I guess is kind of my thought. But from uh... yeah, I mean, I I would disagree with okay. uh, Larry's take sure. on that. I think for every person who is quote motivated by getting fired, um, I would say there's a uh, hundred people who are totally undone and depleted by it. I, and there's some agree. research um, showing that you know the 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 trauma of being without a job for uh, over a year is more traumatic than the loss of your uh, significant other. It's devastating. Well, and yeah. uh, so, so I, you know, I think that is, that is the rare exception. Now, it, you know, certainly um, job crafting within your job and making changes within your job so that you can move toward what you are meant to, to, to really what's, the right fit for you, what aligns with your strengths and your passions, mm-hmm. um, that can be, you know, effective way to uh, work through somebody who is underperforming. And certainly, if somebody chooses to leave their job to to find something else that aligns better with who they are, I think that's something to celebrate. But I don't think um, that we should frame um, getting fired as uh, something that's motivating for most people. Yeah, I I would agree, and I I don't know if he. 
hopefully I didn't paint him in the wrong context there because I think he it was a uh, he kind of painted it because he admitted that he had gotten fired a couple times and he says the way that conversation went was he was comfortable at a job and for one reason or another he was he was let go due to downsizing or what what have you and he ended up going down the path that he ultimately went down which has let led him to be as successful as he's become so that's kind of the way he painted that so hopefully I didn't you know misconstrue his words there but I think um, from my own experience being being fired um, being devastating I think is probably the 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 most flattering and, and nicest word you can say about it from the things that I've experienced but nevertheless I, I think uh, I think everybody, every business, maybe this is too all-encompassing, but they should have that approach where if we're going to hire somebody, then we need to be of the mindset that they're going to be an employee for life. And we're going to teach them and mold them and help them grow and help them uh, develop into the best possible person and the best possible employee for themselves and for our company. And I don't yeah, see... Yeah, and the other piece that that's, I think is a really important element to effective hiring is hiring people not just for their skill set and their experience, but also hiring them for their culture fit. Do they fit with our culture? And there are companies uh, like Weebly, for example, where they will hire somebody based on their well, that they, they would hire somebody on their based on their skill set and their experience, and then. Um, have them do basically like a week trial and yeah. that week trial is just an attempt to see whether or not they're the right fit and um that is a really important piece and uh, a lot of evidence has suggested that culture fit actually matters more than the skill set because you can acquire the skills but it's hard to be able to really uh, reposition somebody if the, if, the, if the cultural fit isn't in place and that that was the next question i was going to ask you uh-huh. Because I the the job interviews that I've sat through, it's really interesting because they ask you, you know, pre-made questions that they asked every candidate depending on the job title or the actual position they're going to be put into. And then, you know, they ask the 10 questions or eight questions, whatever it is, and you answer those questions and then you, um, you know, they, they basically make a decision based off of that. And I'm thinking there's got to be a better way to do this. So given your experience and the thing, people that you've talked to and the, the workplaces that you've been in, what are the best, you kind of mentioned the, the, the culture fit and a one week trial run um, to kind of see if that individual is going to be, that candidate is going to be a good fit for that particular business and that culture and those coworkers. Um, what, what are some other ideas outside of maybe that, trial run that you've seen other other businesses or other companies utilize to make sure that they got the right the right fit for you know right candidate and the right fit for their their particular culture and company well i think a lot of it is the the kinds of questions that you're asking from Mm -hmm. the outset and um but uh you know i should also add i mean this this is an area that um, a lot of people have a lot of expertise on. That's it's not something that I'm as focused on. I mean, my uh, sure. I tend to have more of the philosophy that uh, that everybody has the potential to be able to uh, grow and develop, yeah. and um, and so I w- am more focused on how do we. P- a, how do we help people once they're already there? Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, that how do we also create a culture that is more inclusive for the people who are coming into the workplace? How do we help people to identify their strengths? And then how do we help the organization to be able to move them toward their strengths um, and really capitalize on their strengths so that they're more engaged, but also so that the, their teams are benefit and benefiting as well as the organization? Sure. I, I didn't know if uh, you have any thoughts on that. So I figured I would ask because, you know, given your experience and, you know, di- talking to as many people as you've talked to and being in as many businesses, I know that's not necessarily your, uh, your focus, but I thought I would ask. So thanks for your, your feedback on it anyways, but more, more towards now your focus, I guess, um, employee surveys. I know you, you, 
you mentioned that in the book a little bit. And then I've read a lot about that. So I guess from a uh, employee feedback, obviously that's that's a huge component, an important component of where all of your employees kind of stand um, from a mindset standpoint, from a health standpoint, well-being standpoint, environment standpoint, all down the line. So when you're putting together or you utilize uh, an employee survey, I'm assuming, but I'm hoping you can back me up on this or give your input, that it's important to utilize those you know, questions that refer to those intrinsic motivators, to those multiple dimensions of wellness, to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, just to try to figure out where all those employees are so you can have a, a more focused intervention for that particular company or business. Would you agree with that? Uh, well, I think that when you're designing any kind of an assessment, you want to be really clear about what are the outcomes that you're wanting to achieve and mm -hmm. then build the questions accordingly, the survey accordingly. But I should also add, uh, you know, there's there's the more quantitative kinds of surveys and then the surveys that I really am more interested in and the ones that I tend to, my work tends to incorporate more is, um, you know, I tend to bring in more of the people who have more expertise in developing um, valid sur uh, survey instruments, uh, and I tend to partner with those. But the kind of um, assessments that I really like to do are the ones that are more qualitative in nature and ones that really tell us start to tell the stories. So examples of those are things like um, I will, for example, have um, images that I will show in the context of, say, one of these Managers on the Move workshop. Mm -hmm. um, or in the context, it could be a one-on-one, -on -one, um, or it could be in, uh, in the context of a focus group, for example. And so I'll show a range of different images from positive, positive, negative, positive images, negative images, kind of uh, you know, like it's everything from uh, holding, you know, an image of people showing holding hands to a more negative image that is a horse kicking the other one in the face. Mm -hmm. And or another one is uh, Sherpas carrying heavy backpacks or another one is light coming through the trees. And I'll ask the people to consider if you were to ask the average employee at this organization to pick the image that best depicts their day-to-day -day experience when they're at work, which one do you think they would pick? Or I'll ask individuals, okay, if I were to, looking at these images here, which of these best, do you think best depicts your day-to-day -day experience when you're at work here? Mm -hmm. And so you get somebody who's selecting an image of like the one, uh, the horse kicking the other one in the face where they, they're, it's, they're sharing how when I come to work, I literally feel like I'm yeah. getting kicked in the face. And they share these stories, and then you compile these stories, and that's going to tell you a lot more, sure. in my view, about what's actually going on in the culture mm -hmm. than, uh, than just doing these surveys. Because what, what happens, unfortunately, with a lot of these surveys is, A, people are over-surveyed, and so oh, yeah. they're tired of filling out the sure. surveys, and then it's not a meaningful exercise. And then B, people a lot of times will respond in the way that they're, quote, supposed yeah, to yeah. be responding. Yeah, sure. Whereas um, you create an experience like that, and you're much more likely to get the unvarnished truth and uh, really get some more meaningful dialogue. So that's when, it, you know, when I'm conducting these more informal assessments like mm -hmm. that, these more qualitative assessments, what I'm, what my goal is is really to generate more of a you know more um, meaningful dialogue out sure. of it but you know getting back to the surveys um, certainly you know I've worked either in uh, delivering you know having surveys to accompany the work that I do to measure is their impact or not and um, you want to make sure that you're using validated assessments um, so, uh, and there are a lot that are out there that uh, are in the public domain that you can use. And, um, or you need to bring in somebody who really has expertise who can help you to shape the questions so that you generate meaningful um, data from it. Sure. So when you do the, those photos, mm -hmm. is, that in a, is that in a group setting normally? Is that usually on site at these businesses or companies or is that like a one-on-one -on -one thing or 
How often, uh, how does that normally? So most, yeah, so most of my work is always done in groups. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. And every now and then I'll do some one-on-one -on -one work. Um, like, for example, if I'm working, you know, I did uh, worked very closely with one medical department. Okay. And, um, and so really went through and, you know, interviewed every person in the department. Mm -hmm. and, and I included this as part of that those, those discussions. But most of my work is... I'm either speaking to a large group in yep. the format of a keynote. Mm -hmm. I'm delivering a workshop, like a leadership training work workshop, um, or I'm uh, delivering some kind of a train the trainer kind of workshop, or um, kind of hand in hand with the train the trainer workshop is I have content that's licensed out. So um, in all of those, um, it's more of a kind of more of a learning exercise that's implemented in, in, with that kind of spirit. Um, to really help people to take a more honest look at thinking of something that we think about a lot, but in a slightly different way. So you ask somebody to consider the question, you know, how would you describe your company? Is it a toxic culture or mm -hmm. is it a positive one? You're going to get a very different answer than if you ask them to pick the picture that right. best uh, <laughs> the oh, average yeah. employee would be likely to pick. Yeah, no, I... I think that's awesome. And like you said about people filling out surveys or constantly filling out surveys. Hey, right. So, yeah. And you know, I, I think too, what's interesting about your, your book and what kind of opened my eyes um, going along the lines of surveys is your views on um, health risk assessments. Mm -hmm. And I think the, Every, every wellness program, and the, the, the last job that I had, I, I tried to start one, get one going, but they didn't have any money, which is pretty common. So I was looking for ways in order to get funding. So the state of Ohio, they had this uh, grant that you could get. I think it was, I can't remember how much it was, but they had obviously stipulations to get that grant. And one of the things were, was you had to have, you had to get everybody who was going to participate. That's how they dictated how much money you were going to get is the, the amount of people who completed these biometric screenings. And I thought, you know, because in your book you talk about it kind of starts off in a, a bit of a negative, negative tone because if you're getting reminded right off the get-go that you, you know, you have a BMI of 40 or whatever it might be, like this isn't a super happy way to start this whole thing off. So um, that's a good point about getting inundated with surveys. And I... Like you know, it, obviously it can it can provide good data, but the those health risk assessments I think are I don't want to say they're missing the point, but for lack of a better way of putting it, they're kind of missing the point. Well, again, you know, getting back to our earlier conversation about how everybody knows what to do on a basic level when, when yeah. it comes to improving their health and well being, sure. but less than three percent of Americans put do it, yep. this three basic practices of don't smoke, eat healthy, and get active. So the, the real question is, is what do you want people to actually do as a result of these interventions? What do you want people to actually feel mm -hmm. as a result of these um, initiatives? Uh, not just what do you want them to know. And there's been, um, you know, again, because our field has largely been shaped from the biomedical model, mm -hmm. we have a, a very much of a go to the doctor kind of approach in, when it comes to our health and well-being. And, and I think that that can work well in the safety of a doctor's office. It's very different, though, when we're talking about doing that in the context of a workplace. Mm -hmm. So asking people to submit to these invasive health risk assessments and or biometric screenings, I think is, uh, you know, while the information is is good on in terms of, yes, it's it's good to know this information, but only so only as good as it actually prompts somebody taking action. Sure. And uh, so you can know that you have high cholesterol, but if you don't do anything about right. it, what good does it right. do you? Yeah. No, and furthermore, if you're scaring people with this information, um, a lot of times it can it can backfire where people are even less likely to do it. So it's yeah. really about how do we, this is why I think it's so important that we think about um, shifting this from 
this diagnosis, here's what's wrong with you kind of Mm -hmm. approach to more of an inspiring, here's what's right with you. And how do we build on that? And, um, and how do we infuse hope and optimism into everything that we do so that people really feel safe and confident and they feel appreciated and valued. Uh, They don't feel like that they're getting their blood and information sucked out of them. And, um, and, you know, feeling like that this is only, being done because the company wants to save on their healthcare costs and not right. because they actually care about their employees. Exactly right. I yeah. totally agree. I think to go to take that one step further, um, you mentioned feeling valued and feeling feeling safe in the workplace. And we're talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and all the dimensions of wellness and intrinsic motivators. One of the big topics that I've really kind of dove into or I guess dove, I guess that's right, uh, sure. lightly, is loneliness. And I've read the book Them by Ben Sass. I've read Bowling Alone. I've, I've really gotten pretty deep into this. I actually gave a, I did a breakout session a couple, well, last month in Florida at the National Wellness Conference on loneliness. And it's a big, it's a big topic. It's a very, it's a depressing topic in a sense, but it's also been very, interesting for me to to learn about it and even helpful in a lot of ways. So I was hoping I could get your, we kind of, we kind of talked about it here and there, but your views on how to better build those social connections, because I was talking to Cassie Sobleton. I don't mean to drop names here, but one of the things that she talked about, and I don't know if the surveys that she gives or what, but one of the questions that she mentioned was in one of these surveys was, do you have a best friend at work? And at first I kind of glazed over it, but the more I thought about that, the more powerful that became to me because the experiences that I've had, I felt a lot of times I felt alone when I was at work, right? It was, I, I don't want to feel like it was me versus them kind of a thing, but for lack of a better, better way of putting it, I felt like that sometimes. But then I, my dad, who taught history for 37 years, he still, every Tuesday, goes and has coffee with the guys that he taught almost 40 years with because they're still good friends. And so he has best friends from work and he had best friends at work. So I thought that was a really profound question. So I wanted to get your, your feedback on the importance of those social connections, the loneliness issue, and then how we can try to build those connections at work and again if that's it's probably something that comes from the top but i was hoping i could get your your thoughts on that well so the the question do you have a best friend at work is is part of gallup's q12 Mm -hmm. it's actually q10 um, and they found that that is the number one predictor of the extent to which people are engaged with their work and so that That piece is so critical and um you know it's interesting when i in my work with managers and leaders, when I talk about that and I ask them that question, that same question, do you have a best friend at work? A lot of people feel like that those kinds of things are, are, you know, belong outside of the workplace as opposed to, you know, it's not my job as a manager to A, to become friends with the people that I work with or B, to uh, really make it my job to foster these social connections. So in terms of fostering more, but it is, it has everything to do with engagement. And Mm -hmm. we know that 70% of the workforce is disengaged. So Mm -hmm. every manager needs to know that if they want to have the high, a high performing team, then their team needs to be socially connected with one another. And people need to not only get along, but really feel that sense of having uh, really good friends, if not best friends at work, just like what you're describing yeah. with, with your dad. Mm-hmm. So in terms of, you know, obviously this is a big part of loneliness and um, the importance of social connections. I mean, there's so much research showing that uh, being socially connected, um, feeling like there are other people in the world who are looking out for you is uh, it, the most important element um, to health and well-being. Mm-hmm. That, um, that is... Uh, matters more than exercise. It matters more than diet. Um, Mm -hmm. Not surprisingly, Dean Ornish and the team at Spectrum, when they're working with post-cardiac patients, 
They have four pillars that they focus on. Uh, one is diet, one is exercise, and one is stress management. But the, the fourth one or the, the, the primary one that they stress more than any is what they characterize as love and connection. Yeah. Love and connection. That that is what matters most. Like you're coming off of having had a heart attack. Um, you've come, you're coming off of surgery. And the main thing that you need to focus on more than anything else is love and connection. Mm -hmm. And I think that we simply cannot underestimate how important that is. There's a title of a book that describes the, the AIDS epidemic in Ethiopia and how it has disenfranchised people um, from one another. And the title of the book is, um, There is no me without you. Mm -hmm. As in, we are so high, hardwired to be in connection with one yeah. another that we almost cannot be, be um, without that. And, you know, we certainly see this with the research around um, orphans, for example, those orphans who are, uh, you know, are not um, given uh, loving touch uh, as a baby and never re fully recover from that. So uh, we have such a need for um, that kind of connection and there's just incredible stories uh, like the story in 1994 where um, two neonatal twins um, who were in two separate incubators uh, were struggling and one in particular was really struggling and there was a nurse who saw what was happening and so she lifted the stronger twin out of her incubator and placed her into the incubator with her struggling sister. And the very first thing that the stronger sister did was to throw her tiny little arm around her sister's shoulders. That's and amazing. within moments, her struggling sister's heart rate came up and her vitals um, normalized. And... Um, so whether we're talking about neonatal twins who are struggling to, to survive or we're talking about the everyday person in the workplace, uh, we cannot underestimate just how important those social connections are, but also just people feeling uh, psychological safety at work, people feeling that there is compassion and that people are uh, watching out for them and looking out for them. Um, we just cannot underestimate just how important that is. And so what that translates into is uh, around how do we change, for example, recognition from just recognizing people for what they do to really recognizing people for who they are mm -hmm. as human beings. And so it's a very simple things like, am I as a manager making it a point to get to know the people that I manage? Am I really recognizing people? them as human beings? Am I smiling at them? Am I calling yeah. them by name? Am I asking them about the things that matter in, the, in their lives? Are they, am I getting to know them as human beings? And am I treating them as human beings? It's so, it's so powerful when you feel like you belong or you feel like somebody truly cares about you, that you, you can truly trust somebody else. It's a, you can't really describe it, right? Like it's it's a it's a weird comforting feeling that isn't really like anything else. I mean, I I don't know. I and I think in the workplace, we spend so much time in a workplace. It would only it would only make sense that that would be an important thing to cultivate if you want your business to succeed, if you want to have success long term. And you want your employees to be healthy. I mean, you know, and obviously everybody plays a role in that. It's not just, it's not just the managers or the executives or the supervisors, but you know, it's, they kind of set the tone, I think, obviously, but everybody's got to play a role in that. And I think it's, I think it's possible. And I think it's, it's interesting. Uh, the Dale Carnegie book, uh, how to win friends and influence people. That's a great book too. And, um, there's a few things that, that really sat with me and stuck with me since I read it, which is a few years ago now. But one of the things that he says in there is try to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, right? Like you don't know what they're going through. You don't know what, what they've experienced that day or that month or that year. So the way you treat them, like it can have a significant impact whether you see it or not. So it's like, just kind of don't, don't be a jerk, you know? So I, uh, I appreciate you sharing that. I think you made a 
phenomenal argument to anybody who might listen to this that it's important to uh, to make sure that these are the things that are cultivated. I and I guess the 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 interventions for that like it can it can probably be really small things, but you can have really big things too. Like I know I've read uh, about Google where I think it's every like once a week maybe they the head honchos of Google they meet with employees and they take questions from employees for an hour or whatever it might be and even that i think is something that can be hugely powerful because you know they're not just the the people that make a lot of money and are sitting in their ivory tower kind of a thing it's like no they're down here with you talking to you and getting your feedback and then especially if they implement things that these lower level employees are saying it makes them feel good. It makes them feel like they matter. It makes them feel like they're uh, a part of the team. Yeah, absolutely. And um, that is a regular practice that they have there, that the, the founders are, are still engaged in conversation with team members to get their in, input and that they're really encouraging that people ask real questions. And uh, what you see so often, and um, Laszlo Buck, who is the former um Chief Human Resources Officer there uh, talks about this in, in his book about how there are a lot of companies who've tried to become like Google and they just see the superficial things like mm -hmm. the the beanbag chairs and the happy hour and yep. the on-site gym or the on-site meditation room mm -hmm. or the uh, pool table and um, but it's the deeper things like the the senior leaders and the managers coming out and um, showing full transparency, showing vulnerability, uh, to be able to get up there in front of a group and and accept real questions um, and and uh, and actually answer them in a meaningful way. Those are the kinds of things that really are characteristic of a of a great culture, not just having uh, kind of the de rigueur kinds of. Um, accoutrements of sure. uh, what makes for a sexy company. I, I mean, I've been in plenty of organizations that have all of those uh, kinds of things and A, nobody's going in them yeah. because mm -hmm. uh, they're afraid to, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, but B, there's all kinds of toxicity that's going on that's tolerated and, um, and that there's not real meaningful transparency, um, which is a hallmark of a, of a great culture. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think too, a lot of times the the downside of using Google as an example of you know a, a culture of well-being is people always say, well, they got a gajillion dollars, right? So they can do whatever they want to do. But you can you can create a culture of well-being, a culture of value, a culture of you know autonomy or people feeling as if they they matter and they have those connections. You can you can create that in any any size company, right? Maybe that's you don't... exactly right. And a lot of those companies that are more like Google that have these kinds of resources, mm -hmm. um, at the same time, have a really negative culture. And yeah. they, you know, case in point, uh, somebody who I was talking with was describing how her daughter was at one of those companies that uh you know a company that everybody wants to work for mm -hmm. um, because it seems like the cool place to work and meanwhile it's a uh, really negative culture and um and it's held over their heads the fact that uh, if they leave there's going to be somebody else who wants to fill their spot yeah. so nobody feels really valued mm -hmm. and so her daughter left this place and, and went to another company a much smaller company mm -hmm. And uh, first thing is she w was brought on board and um, was taken out to dinner by the entire um, senior leadership uh, team and um, had was assigned a mentor uh, to work with her and people were really kind to her. And her experience there, uh, this is a company with very few resources in comparison to the other one, was um, that this is a place where she actually wants to be and she's yeah. so much happier there. Yeah. So I think it's important to remember that. And I do in my talks and in my workshops, I, I, try, I try to really highlight examples of the non-Googles uh, to yeah. help other organizations realize that there's actually a lot of things that they can do. So sure. a great example of that is a company called Myron Construction Company, which is in your part of the world. It's in okay. Wisconsin. Okay. Yeah. And this is a, a company that um, – 
They have, uh, in addition to an on-site wellness coach, a woman by the name of Meredith Batchik, uh, they also have an on-site dream coach. His name is Eric Marco. So how many companies can say that they have an on-site dream coach? And um, so exactly. So this is somebody, his job is to work with people at the company to help them to identify what their dream is and help them to create a plan toward that. And they have this really cool dream board on site, uh, which has the prompt before I die, I want to blank. And so people are thinking about what their dreams are and they're, they're even bringing this out to the community. So there's all kinds of amazing examples like that, that go far beyond just Google. Mm -hmm. Uh, Another great example, is um, Sioux Falls uh, United Way. There's one person there, a woman by the name of Colleen Thompson, who is the uh, formerly was their CFO, and she decided she wanted to get in better shape, and uh, she had quit, come off of quitting smoking, and so she decided that she was going to start walking every day a mile each time, and so she mapped out an outdoor route and an indoor route, and then she smartly got her teammates to join her on that and so that organization even uh following colleen's retirement they have been walking together as an organization a mile each time every day for uh 14 years now that's amazing i mean and there's so many so many different what uh dimensions of wellness in there or just basic human needs right like your interaction with nature and your social connections and then your physical activity. And there's so many, so many positives. It's something as simple as getting a group and going for a walk. I love it. That's right. I love it. So I got a couple more things I was hoping to get your, your opinion on and then I can let you go. So I've, I've enjoyed the talk so far. So I appreciate you taking the time. No, you bet. Um, so I actually just read something today, actually. And I'm like, this is awesome because I'm talking to Laura today. So I might as well ask her thoughts about it. So I read this article, uh, it's been all over the place, but the first place I saw it was CNN, so I printed it out. But the headline is, Microsoft tried a four-day work week in Japan and productivity, and productivity jumped 40%. Productivity went 40%. Yeah. Yep. That's, yeah. That's amazing. And I obviously, you can't, you can't go into a workplace and say, hey, I think you should you know, make your employees work less. That's kind of a weird way to start, but obviously there's something to this, right? So I was hoping you could uh, reflect on that for me because I'm sure you Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one question that I ask all the time is, if you were a battery, where would you say that you are? And I'll show a spectrum of batteries Mm -hmm. from being fully depleted to fully charged. And uh, so really starting to the question, ask yourself the question, do I have the energy that I need to be an effective leader? Mm-hmm. Do I, uh, do my team members have the energy that they need to become a high performing team? And so it's really about transitioning our framework from face time to net productivity yeah. and understanding that if I take breaks uh, uh, along uh, over the course of the day, then I'm going to have more energy and my net productivity will go up and really making that distinction between net productivity, be- between net productivity and FaceTime. And there's so many companies that are forcing their employees to be accountable for every minute, um, thinking that they're going to increase productivity when instead all they're doing is they're increasing face time. Yeah. I mean, case in point, one uh, law firm that we worked with, there was such a culture around face time that when people would leave at the end of the day, they would leave their coat on the back of their chair so that their coworkers would think that they were still at work. Wow. That's how much of a culture there was around um, FaceTime, and uh, but what the the research clearly shows, and what this this kind of um, these kinds of headlines point out, is the fact that we need to we're human beings, we're not machines, mm-hmm. and we need to recharge, and our productivity will go up, our creativity will go up, our capacity to innovate, yeah. our ability to be part of a team, all of that goes up. Um, our focus goes up. Um, when we're able to recharge. And yeah. so uh, allowing that uh, downtime for people is is so essential, especially as we've moved into an era of being always on. Uh, the reality is that we need, we need time um, off uh, so that we can do what we do better. Right. Yeah. And I think there's other ways, even, you know, again, you can't, I don't think maybe you can, but... 
you probably can't go into a place that you're working with from a well-being standpoint, workplace wellness, well-being standpoint, and say, you got to give your people an extra time off. But there are other ways that you can increase that productivity. I know for me, for example, if I'm sitting at home and I'm trying to do work on my computer, I, or I'm sitting at, you know, when I have to go to work, whatever it might be, your, my engagement in that work may not be as up to par because it could be something else I should be doing or washing the dishes at home, whatever it might be. But if I go out to a, a coffee shop and I can sit there and I can, you know, for whatever reason, I feel like I can get way more done at a coffee shop drinking my vanilla latte. I try to minimize those because obviously they're full of sugar, but nevertheless, <laughs> um, in, you know, in that type of a setting, I can get more done than, you know, being forced to be stuck somewhere else. Right. So there's, I guess that what I'm trying to say is there's middle grounds to go from where we're currently at, where people are overworked to giving them literally more, you know, a day off or more time off to recharge. So what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. I mean, that's a, a message that I uh, am sharing over and over again, again, especially with these managers, that mm -hmm. there are ways to, to build in more of these breaks along the way uh, and make it part of your day-to-day -day, uh, schedule. Mm -hmm. So thinking about every team meeting, how might we start off with, like they do at Eileen Fisher, they begin with a minute of silence. Yeah. It takes a minute. Mm -hmm. It's not a program. It's not a standalone program. It's just a practice that they have as, as uh, at that company that's built into all of their team meetings. Um, or it might be something like what they have at LinkedIn, which is a, a regular practice of walking meetings. Yeah. So, you know, getting a company to get on board with uh, a big, huge policy change like um, – having a four day work week is really tough to do, right, right. but, um, building in a quick one minute stretch at the beginning mm -hmm. of your team meeting yep. is pretty doable. Sure. And that's something that is well within the reach of, mm -hmm. of every individual yeah. and every team leader and yep. every organization. And it's free. It doesn't cost anything. So that can't be an mm -hmm. excuse not to do it. Right. That's right. Yeah. So, and it can be more than a stretch. I yeah. mean, it can be something like naming three good things and mm -hmm. that's been shown to help rewire our brains to sure. be to become more optimistic yeah. so uh, helping us to become more resilient yeah no absolutely so that i wanted to i wanted to bring that up to you because i read that and it like it just blew my mind that giving some, giving people a whole eight hours off or a whole day off you would think most people would would attach like okay they're not working as much so they're not going to get as much done but in reality it's the opposite and it's like that that should that should tell people something. And I don't know, it just blew my mind. And I, I, I love seeing that. Granted, you know, I, I don't know where we're going to be as an American culture if we're ever going to get there. I have heard I have read that it's kind of I don't want to say it's becoming more and more commonplace, but people are taking risks. People are, uh, I guess, piloting this and people are starting to get the hint like, hey, I think we're, we're overworking our employees here and maybe if we give them some more time to, to enjoy life, maybe they could be more productive for us. So yeah, I thought that was, thought that was awesome. So thanks for sharing your thoughts there. Um, so yeah, I will let you go here, but before I let you go, I figured I would ask you um, because I very much enjoyed talking to you. I enjoyed reading your book. I'm excited to hear that you have another one coming out. I'm excited to read that one. And uh, I wanted to give you a, a, a chance to, if anybody happens to listen to this, hopefully a lot of people will, um, once they see that you're on it, but talk about what it is. I know you're over in California on opposite sides of the country here, but talk about what it is you do with Motion Infusion, with, with giving, giving talks, writing your books, how people can get a hold of you, how people can learn more about you. And hopefully whoever does listen to this will reach out to you and get in touch with you and learn more about you and about employee wellness in general. Well, that's great. Thank you so yeah, much. Sure. I mean, certainly, uh, first and foremost, I'm very active on social media. Okay. So I encourage everybody to connect with me. I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on uh, Instagram. It's Laura Putnam author. I'm on Twitter, which is at Motion Infusion. And um, 
Facebook. And uh, so I'm always eager to have conversations with people. So mm-hmm. I really encourage you to, to reach out to me that way. And I encourage you to follow uh, my work. Um, you're also welcome to come to the Motion Infusion website, www.motioninfusion.com, as well as the Laura Putnam website, uh, lauraputnam.com. And there's an opportunity there where you can sign up for the newsletter. So I encourage you to join the movement and be part of a a larger conversation around how we can help uh, to create workplaces that are healthier, happier, and smarter. And um, I am always, uh, you know, one email away Mm -hmm. uh, or one phone call away. So I also encourage people are more than welcome to reach out to me that way as well. Um, Laura at motioninfusion.com or by phone 415-310-5505. Perfect. I I really enjoy all the content that you do share. I especially on LinkedIn. I'm on there fairly often. So I see a lot of the stuff that you're posting and I, I read it. I share it myself, so I awesome. appreciate that. Thank you. You know, abs- no, absolutely. And like I said, I I'm I don't want to brown nose too much, but I'm dead serious when I say I I appreciate your work. I appreciate your book. I've learned a lot from you, and I appreciate the conversation very much. And hopefully, we can do it again in the future. Look forward to it, and thank you so much for a great interview. Oh, sure, absolutely. Thanks very much. <laughs> All right. Have a good rest of your night. Okay, you too, Justin. Right, Thank thanks, you again. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you for tuning in. Today's podcast is brought to you by Kinzit Technologies. Kinzit Technologies provides the highest quality technical support services in Michigan and Ohio. Specializing in EMR support in the medical field, Kinzit provides all of your hardware, desk side, and help desk services to keep your critical devices online and running. Kinzit is focused on providing excellent service for an always-on connection in your business with the goal of providing you reassurance that your networks and servers are online and secure. Reach out to Kinzit Technologies today for your free consultation. Go to www.kinzit.com. That's www. K-I-N-Z-I-T dot com. podcast is for informational purposes only and is not designed or intended to diagnose or treat any medical professional or individual difficulty a person, group, or entity.